Alrighty, welcome back to the third session of our conference. This session is going to be presented by David Benome. Uh, he's going to be running a session on the perfect data input table for Microsoft Excel. Uh, if you don't know David, he began his career as a chartered accountant in Deloitte, London, and now runs a data analytics and training firm, Excel Consulting, in Cambodia, the country's only official Microsoft Office Power BI partner. The firm has trained over 1,800 people and consulted with over 100 clients in six years. Uh, David has been a Microsoft MVP in 20, uh, from 2020. The YouTube channel covers many business apps, Excel, Sheets, Power BI, PowerPoint, Teams, Zoom, Word, Outlook, etc. Uh, his videos are featured on the Microsoft 365 official channel. David also blogs on Excel for the UK Accounting Institute, co-chairs the London Financial Models Group, and Cambodia's official Power BI and Excel user group. So welcome to David and we'll see his presentation now. Hi, my name is David Benayman. and I'm going to show you the ultimate Excel data table. So let's start by looking at what our output wants to be. So here I am in Excel and as you can see here, I have this table. Now it is set up with this special table formatting, which means as I add in a new column or anything like that, all the formatting comes across automatically. Um, and I do have these color coding. So every time there's a weekend, it's color coded. So, for example, if this changes for argument's sake to a weekend, let's do this two days afterwards, which would be a Sunday, then the whole one would change. Uh, there are also column instructions for each one. You also can't enter the wrong thing, so you have these drop down lists. And also, as you start typing, it will give you a restricted list of what that could be, which is quite nice. So, yeah, we're going to go through how to set this up and all of the steps that we need to get there. So, let's uh, go back to slides a bit. So my name is David Benayim and I run a company called Excel Consulting. We've done corporate training, mostly in Excel for over 2,000 people. And we've consulted in Excel related matters with over 100 organizations. So I have been an MVP for the last two and a half years. And I also have a YouTube channel, which is not amongst one of the bigger ones for Excel, but it's growing. I get just over a thousand views per day and I just hit seven and a half thousand subscribers. I release weekly videos on general business technology. Excel is a big, big part, but I also have stuff on Google Sheets. Um, Power BI, Zoom, Teams, if you're using tech of the workplace, and I'm covering it on my channel, and I love talking about the new stuff. Great, so six components to this. We'll start with setting up an actual table, then we'll go into auto color, defining data types, things to avoid, good practice, and then we'll do a summary. So an actual table here. Now, let me, uh, let me take a bit of a break from Excel, and let's look at another app, which is Word. <laughs> I'm sure you're very familiar with Word. And let's say, for example, that we want to um, create a table in Word. Now, a lot of people know how to do that, and that is if you go to the Insert tab, you can choose Table here. And what that does is it creates a really nice layout like this, and you have these designs that you can choose from. And what's particular about these designs is you can add different rows, and the formatting would come across automatically, essentially because the formatting here is done on a table-wide basis rather than what Excel typically does. So if I were to copy and paste this into Excel, let's do a new Excel file, Control-N, paste that like that, then we do keep the formatting, but if I insert some new rows, then suddenly my formatting doesn't really work and a new column will not bring across the formatting either. So it's not really great. And the way that I show this in my lessons is I ask people, how do you set up a table in Word? And they show me, then I say, well, what about PowerPoint? And it's the same, it's in certain table. So it is, and again, we get the table menu here. Now it's a slightly different in PowerPoint. It has fewer features than Word, but essentially it's the same kind of styles, same in Outlook. But then what about Excel? So with Excel, they always tell me, well, Excel already is a table because that's what most of us think. But if that were the case, if I went to the Insert tab, I wouldn't see a table here. And I do, and that is because it is an amazing feature that not many people know exists. So let's uh, take a look at it. So over here, I have my, uh, my table as it was set up. And what very often happens is that typically you get these, someone had a nice idea of setting up these different headers and then these other things in gray. Uh, in, in white below with these borders, but then people do some copy and paste. And as we know, these things sometimes break when you do that sort of thing. So ultimately it becomes kind of tricky to get it to work and to, uh, to operate the way we expect it to. So essentially I'm gonna copy those down and let's go down here and see something that is a table. So a table in Excel, what you can do is you can add in a new row, for example, and then everything will grow automatically, including anything that's linked to it. So this chart is linked to the above table, which means if we add something new, then that will grow as well. So over here, I can keep adding, and as you can see, the chart as well is linked. And if I add in a new column, then that will add here. Note that as well that these formulas came down automatically, 
And anything that's linked to this, including a VLOOKUP, a pivot table, a SUMIF, will automatically grow if the source data is a table. So let's look at how to do that. So first we're going to select this and we're going to get rid of our formats. So we're going to go into, in the home tab, you have clear dropdown, you have clear formats here. And that's what we're going to choose to go to zero formats. And after that, we're going to um, go to the insert tab and choose table. Press OK. Make sure that this is ticked. And then you get this, you get the table design menu with these styles you can choose from. Um, some say they're not the, the most attractive of styles, but you can have more customizations. For example, if you don't like any of the of the banded rows, as it's called, you can just go to one of these and you can even untick banded rows and it will get rid of the borders. You can choose banded columns, which usually would mean different colors like this, but in these cases just means the borders rather than the rows. So yeah, you have complete control over that. Um, you can make the first or the last column look differently as well. You can remove the header row. I've never myself found a use case for that, but it is something that you can remove if you don't want to see it. So this is essentially a table and so um, let's go back to having banded rows and take off banded columns. Uh, so a couple of other things. So if I scroll down, I can see that I have a freeze panes like setting. So instead of having my normal column name num letters, which is ABC, uh, FGHI, if I click inside my table, I get the names of the columns instead. And that only happens if two th criteria is met. Firstly, you can't see them in the normal view. If you can, then you don't get that feature. And secondly, you need to click inside the table, click out, and it doesn't work. You can also filter without having to scroll back up by clicking on that. And you can also just select the column by click moving up and clicking on this down arrow. Click again, it'll select with the header. Click a third time, and it'll select the entire column. So really, really useful if you just want to do a selection or a change based on just that table, which is usually what you want if you think about it. Um, normally, when people want to make an adjustment, they want to do it to the column, but the column being just for the table. I switched off my camera now um, to get it to work better. Great. So. If I add a new column, so let's say here are females, then I, you may think, well, I want to add these two together. So I'm going to do a formula in that. But note that when I add a new column, all the formatting comes across automatically. If you don't want that to happen, you get this lightning and you can press undo. Um, if you add below 22 and say 23, then everything comes across, including these formulas that were over here. Undo will also get rid of that. So let's add this again. Note that Control-Z undo will keep what you've done, what you've edited, but it will remove the special table formatting, which is kind of a semi-undo. Um, and now where it really comes into play is how it works with formulas. So over here, if I do equals this one plus this one, you'll see two things happen. Firstly, the formulas do come down automatically. Secondly, and again, if you don't want that to happen, you can click there and do undo. By the way, try and avoid doing this, stop automatically creating column calculation, or the other one, which is if I do new, then the ones that say stop, they can be pretty tricky to get back. So ne next, if I add in a new thing, I don't get that. I don't, don't even get the pop-up. I want to get it back. Um, what I need to do is go to file and then options. And then it is pretty hidden. It's in proofing and autocorrect options and then auto format as you type. So this is the table and the table calculated columns as well. So it's pretty difficult to get back. I wish it would at least give you the pop-up. That way you can click on it in fewer things, but it doesn't. Um, so yeah, so one thing is that the formula comes down automatically. The other thing is that it now references the name of the column instead of the cell reference. So normally when we would do a cell reference formula, that would be something like G2 plus H2. But here it is now referencing the name of the column, which is girls plus women. Now, if I change the name to say, um, I don't know, Beatles and Bettles, <laughs> Beatles and say ants, then it is now adding those together. Note that if you do have two words, so praying mantis, then it will give you slightly different notation. Uh, the at symbol refers to the current row, the, the row of your output and your input is the same. And you have extra square brackets if you have multiple words, if you have a space. Otherwise, it just looks like this. You don't know how to write it, um, but just that's how it refers to it. The other way in which formula writing is good is, for example, if you do an entire column. So if I do this one, for example, and I close my brackets, I get 354. Um, but Let's compare that, and, and then if I add in a new number below, that is the sum of praying mantis of table number 32. So if I add in a new row, then that would get added into the total, and I get this again. Note that that's different from, let's say I have some random numbers like this, and I want to add them together. If you're a big Excel user, convert those into values. If you're a big Excel user, you're probably aware that if I add in another number here, that won't be added into the total. Total will end here. Now, this is something that we're aware of, but it happens so often that it even has its own name devoted to this kind of error. It's called an error of omission because you are emitting what's happening underneath. Um, if you have a table, then this will not happen. Now, 
Um, my opinion is that most Excel users think that they already use tables. So they would never Google, how do I make a table in Excel? Which means I tend to call these things super tables because it's kind of like a table with superpowers. I really think that Excel needs to give it a better name. I mean, something like pivot table, you may not know what it does, but you, if you've heard the word, you know that it does something different to what you're used to. Whereas a table, nothing's ever gonna make you Google, how do I do something inside a table? Um, now note that it does say table 32. You can rename your table if you go to click inside, go to table design, and then change the name to, um, I don't know, maybe this is movies. You can't have a space. If you do a space, it will tell you it doesn't work. So you can either do like this, which is something called camel casing or an underscore, and then it does work. This is also recommended if you are gonna do other things for good practice. Um, it's not something I always do. Well, I didn't used to, but now I do a little bit more. And if you are gonna use features like Power Query, then tables are essential for that. Some other things that you can do with it. So let's say you want to resize it. So there's three ways to resize, either auto by adding new columns and rows as we saw, or with this, this is the resizing handles like that. You can drag it up and down. Note that if you resize it, then you lose the formatting and also these will give you errors because this doesn't mean anything anymore. Uh, but if you wanna resize on the left, then you need to do something slightly different. So I'm adding new columns there. So in table design, if you go to resize table, you can click here and then re choose your new table dimensions, and then it will give you these placeholder names, column one, column two. Control shift L to add remove filters so we can see those like that. Um, so yeah, tables are really the best way to go. Um, as one of the people who I worked with said, this is the way Excel is meant to be used. So uh, some other tricks, if you want to fast forward what I showed you, so instead of clear formats and then insert table, you can go to format as table, you can right click on something that you like and you can choose apply and clear formatting. Press OK, and now it will give you the standard table like that. Uh, then you can do, for example, equals sum of these three, tab, cost for Thailand equals this one times, uh, the cost is here, F4, tab, and this one is equals this one divided by that, enter. And I just want to point out just how much faster your entire Excel infrastructure becomes if you use tables. Select your data. Also, if you if you use your shortcuts, control space to select a column, shift space to select a row, in a table that will only do it for the, ta the column row inside the table, not including the headers or not including everything like this. So really good like that. So I'm going to press control shift percent to make that a percent. You also have totals. So if you, if you click on total row, then it will give you a total for each one. You get an option what you want. So maybe this would be better as an average. Um, here for each one, you can click on sum. And then once you have that, you can drag that across. Note that control R, R for right does not work, is now still totaling this one. It uses a subtotal function, which means that the total stays correct when you have filters. So if I filter this for something and press okay, now it's showing me one plus four, which is five. It's not showing me the total of everything. Uh, something to be aware of because often you do want the total of everything. Great, so. Um, that is tables. And I just want to point out how much faster your entire Excel infrastructure is. Like how much faster did I add those columns over there? If you want to go back to a normal um, range, then Excel calls that a range. What we think is a table, Excel calls a range. So if you click on table design, convert to range, it says you want to convert it to a normal range, press yes. And now it keeps the formatting as is, but the formulas are back to what they were. And if you were to drag down, for example, you lose all that formatting special thing. The key thing is formatting should be done on a table-wide basis, not on a cell-by-cell -cell basis for these. All right, so that is the tables. The other way that, yeah, so a normal table looks bad versus a super table, it can be automatically formatted. You can auto fill formulas. You get named ranges automatically. And then um, you can get a total automatically and it does grow based on what's in there. So next up, let's do automatic coloring. We've already covered a way to color your cells on a table-wide basis, but what about if you want to do it based on criteria? So conditional formatting is one of Excel's prettiest tools and it's very rarely used. The thing I use it for the most probably is this text that contains, but you can format things pretty much anyway. So what you get often is here, you get people highlighting something, not writing why, and that leads to you not really understanding what's been highlighted. Whereas with the conditional formatting here, if something changes to no, that goes red, and if something is paid, that is back to um, not being red anymore. So how do, do we do that? You can select your data and go to conditional formatting, highlight cell rules, text that contains, and choose yes. You can type it in if it's not there, and you can choose a color, press okay. And these are not tables because I'm gonna show you that these all work independently from each other. You don't need to do them together to get there. So this is now paid as yes, and it is much better to do it that way. Note that it's text that contains. So if this says yes paid last week, that is still going to be in green. 
but if it's misspelled, so let's say this is yet, no, it's not going to work like that. And it's dynamic, so it changes based on what's in there. Other useful ones here are duplicates, so conditional formatting duplicate values. And here you can show it in a color like that. So if you change that, then both of the duplicates become uncolored, which is quite nice. Uh, it works with text as well. You also have, if you have numbers like this, you can do data bars, that can be quite nice. And here, if you have this kind of table, which is a pivoted table, we're gonna cover these later on, how to deal with them. For this kind of matrix arrangement, then that works really well with color scales like this. We can have the highest in green, the lowest in red. If you wanna see outliers, it's super easy because that will be a lot greener than the rest. Another trick, so if you wanna get all these totals really, really fast, you can use the shortcuts, alt equals. So alt equals in one cell will write a sum function. Alt equals in the entire table will give you all of these sum functions horizontally and vertically, which is really awesome. If you have these gaps laid out in the past, uh, laid out before you do your data. You can also highlight more than a number. So conditional formatting, highlight cell rules greater than, and click on this cell. We want that green to match the color of the source. Press okay. And for dates, it might be tempted to think that dates are done this way, but this is only for relative dates like, um, you know, this week or before today, after today, that's updating based on when you have the file open. If you want to do it based on an absolute date, then it is again, greater than and less than because Excel treats dates like numbers. So if I do greater than, uh, let's say 1st of July, 2018, then it is going to show you like that. Um, by the way, it's safer to write it like this because, yeah, if you write one seven, then depending what computer it is, it should adjust automatically. Sometimes it doesn't though. So I do this because this is always going to be the same, whichever country you are in, as long as it's native English speaking. If it's not native English speaking, then you're almost definitely going to do one dash seven and that will be first of July. But I like doing this so that Americans don't screw it up, which they usually do. Um, you also have icon sets. So these are probably the ones I use the least. Um, you can set it like that because for icon sets, you do need to go to manage rules and then edit the rule. You need to set the limits. By the way, I have YouTube videos that show these in a lot more detail on my channel if this is something that you are interested in. So uh, 100 and this is 35. So yeah, I go into a lot more detail on these, including a shorter video on the optimal setup table. So then this can match what's going on here. Uh, let me show you my YouTube quickly. So... So I do have weekly videos. Um, the background of the video te uh, template or the thumbnail is what app it's on. So green is Excel. As I said, all of this is new stuff that's just been released. Yellow is Power BI, red is PowerPoint, black is various apps. Uh, yeah, yellow can be Power Query as well, which could also apply to Excel. This is Teams, this is Visio, one-off that I did, Zoom, Outlook. Yeah, so it's all about the background of it. Apart from my older videos where I didn't have this same methodology. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. You can also follow me on LinkedIn. So Dave Benheim, uh, is my Twitter handle. David Benheim is on LinkedIn as well. So um, yeah, I, I always publish what I write on my LinkedIn. Yeah, it's also David Benheim there. Great. Cool. And there's all sorts of uh, other advanced conditional formatting things that we can do. So one of the most commonly asked one is how do you do something that will color the entire row? So here, if I change the date, as I showed you earlier to 16th, it will now the entire row will not be red anymore. Uh, red or orange is the weekend. So how do we do that? Um, I'm going to set up my data. I'm going to go to conditional formatting and new rule. And I'm going to say, okay, let me press cancel first. What is very important is where your active cell is. Now, usually when you select multiple cells, your active cell doesn't matter because whether this is your active cell or this one, changing the color will do that or changing the text color will do that. So it doesn't matter usually, but in this case, so that is the same as that. With conditional formatting, it does matter where your active cell is. So always select the topmost cell of the column that you want to link to. And now I'm going to go to conditional formatting, new rule, and I'm going to write a formula to determine a rule, which is this one. So I'm going to say equals, and then the cell equals, and then in speech marks, I'm going to say, let's say Tuesday is going to be in I don't know, a blue color. So go to fill, like that. So this is saying equals A7 equals two to Tuesday, and it's absolutely referencing. So a7 is only going to look at that cell. And this is not quite it, and let me show you why. So now, whenever I have Tuesday, it is not working for these two. But if I was to press this one to make this one to Tuesday, by the way, these are formulas that are getting the day of the week based on this. So if I go four days earlier to 16th, no, that's Monday. <laughs> My math isn't that good. 
Then I do Tuesday, then all of them change. And that's because they're all changed on this one, and that is locked in. What you want to happen is you want it to only refer to this cell, but the, the, the cells can move up and down, but not left to right. So to do that, go to Manage Rules, and here I'm going to double click it, or I can edit it. Note that in the new version, you can resize this. You can also duplicate a rule, which is how I did Saturday and Sunday to be the same, just changing a little bit in it. So if I edit the rule, and what I want to do is keep the dollar in front of the eight, get rid of the dollar in front of seven, press OK, and OK again. And now my Tuesdays are in blue. And if this becomes two days before, so 21st, now it is showing me in blue as well. But this doesn't expand automatically with a new column. You need to adjust them. So that can get a little bit annoying. So manage rules, then I have to say applies to so K, um, extend that until L. This is one of the few things that doesn't update when you expand the table. So is these kind of conditional formatting rules. All right. So that's conditional formatting. You can also do top 10, top five, like the three biggest selling clients, things like that. Any number above a certain amount, as I showed you, color scales or a custom formula. So that's auto color. Let's go next into defining data types. One of the biggest issues that people have when they set up Excel tables is that they don't define data types, which means that you can get all sorts of issues happening. So for example, here you can get maybe someone entering a date the way they shouldn't enter it. So here is, this is not an allowed date, which means some formulas will break. Um, or they can type in whatever they want, you know. They can, for example, say here, uh, let's say just gobbledygook, and that will work. Or they can just say Mr. Sokun, like that, when they make a misspelling of this one, which is also a different way of saying it like that. Uh, they get all sorts of things. Whereas what you should do is aim to have a drop down list like this. And if you press me, for example, the boss told me to tell me you're fired, so I thought I'd share it through Excel. As well as being a horrendously useful skill, this is also a really good way to do a practical joke on your coworker. So let's look at how to do that. So what you do is you write a list of your allowed fields like this, and then you go to your consultants list like this, and then you go to insert, and you choose, sorry, you go to data, and you choose data validation. And then here, you choose allow to be a list, which is in the dropdown source, it's going to be here. Now I usually leave a couple of blanks at the end, uh, just in case the list needs to expand. Press enter and then OK, like this. And then you end up getting your drop down list like that, which is pretty useful. So the most common type of data validation is going to be a list. But I have a major problem with how this works, because in the real world, very often, we have extraordinarily long lists of data. And until recently, Excel did not know how to handle this. So I actually used Google Sheets instead of Excel. Um, to make a lot of my optimal tables because you weren't able to search for a list. So if you have a lot of entries, which happens fairly frequently, it would take the data entry person hours and hours to enter data to look through the list. Let me show you an example. So over here, let's say that we have this number of entries. Could you imagine if you had to go through each one of these and get it to work? Now, you could do something called dependent drop-down list, which is Everyone has lots of videos on it where you have, first you select Asia, then you select next list, Southern, Southeastern Asia, then the country, then the province or the city. But even that takes absolutely ages. Um, what's much better is this that you're able to do in the newer Excel versions, which is here I can type in and it will search for whatever I want. So Mike will type in that, Micronesia will give me all of these in Micronesia, or I can do, you know, go straight to the next level, or I can go straight to I'm just typing in here, HR, you know, these are peculiar things that have HR next to each other in these countries, and you can type in and then you can get whatever you want. This becomes incredibly useful, and I end up using it quite a lot. For example, for my mock timesheets, here, what I have, this is what I do in my actual timesheets, which are building Google Sheets rather than Excel, because Google Sheets has allowed this functionality for years and years and years and years. So I know the three-letter codes that go like this, so I can just say, for example, DVD, and it will give me directly that, rather than dbt will give me that, you know, because that will be the, the codes that I know, or the client name. Sometimes you can call things in different ways. So, for example, stp is the name of the client, but chain is the name of the project. Sometimes I'll enter chain, sometimes I'll enter stp. They will always give me the right answer. Um, and to do this, you have to have insider Excel, which means you have to have the beta version. It's a Microsoft 365 only feature. These are custom tabs that I've built for myself to keep track of what's in each release cycle. <laughs> so to complete dropdowns is still in that, but it is also in Excel online, which is quite nice. Or if you really want these kind of things right now, you can use Google Sheets, and Google Sheets has a way to do that. So my drop-down list allows me to type in 
like that, and that will give me all of the available options that start with an S, regardless of where they are. And it will search any one of these words, which is quite good. Um, this works with Google Sheets, as does images and cells, um, using the image function, whereas the image function was just released for Excel for Insiders, so it doesn't yet work. You can convert a URL to an image with the image function equals image. To show you that that does work in Excel, I can copy that, and here I can paste it, and then in Excel I can write equals image, close. All right. Sometimes it will give you this blocked error. Um, other times it will give you the actual image, which is nice. Uh, yeah, so I did show you how to do this. By adding data validation in the newer versions of Excel, it does automatically make it searchable. A couple of other things that it does um, with the newer versions. Let me do it back here. So let's say that I have a location list like this. If you have, oh well, let's do, um, yeah, let's do a shorter list like this one, you know, this is a, an example. So let's say that these are my input cells and I go to data, data validation, and I choose this as a list that must come from here. I'm gonna choose with some blanks. If you have a newer version of Excel, it won't show you the blanks. And if you enter data, it will work. Also, it will show you, it will not show you duplicates. So here I have camera in twice, but it's just showing me there once. If you don't have the beta version of Excel, both of those things will not be correct. The other thing that tends to go with it is this other function called TechSplit. Um, I think that both of them go really well hand in hand together. TechSplit has just been released for all Microsoft 365 subscribers if you're on the current channel as of the last week, essentially. So TechSplit means you can choose a delimiter and then split it based on that. So that's useful if you want to get the location to be chosen like this, but you still want someone to be able to filter based on continent and or country. So going back to this one, it could be useful because here, I mean, I can't filter just by this location, just all of South America, etc., particularly easily. Whereas if I do equals text split, then I select my text and my column delimiter is going to be speech marks space and then this and then space again. And then I close my brackets and it will separate it out like that. Note that it, it will not split on spaces where it says South America, it will only split based on that. I will caveat this by saying this is a dynamic array and a dynamic array, unfortunately for the moment, will not work with tables. So if I make this into a table, which is a shortcut control T, then I will get this spill error. That's really unfortunate, um, but that's how it is for now. You can't use dynamic array formulas of which text split is one inside this. By the way, the opposite of text split is text join. I love text join, especially you can combine it with an if formula to make it conditional. And where you refer to a dynamic array start and end, you will get this symbol. So that's regardless of whether it's how long it is, it will, it's the dynamic array that is starting there. So, all right, I've written this wrong, sorry. <laughs> so speech marks, let's do semicolon, space, and then speech marks, that's my delimiter. Ignore empty, you almost always wanna write true, press tab there, and then this is my text that I wanted to join, like that. Scroll down, and then you get it appearing like this. Um, array to text is a simpler version of this. So array to text, you just have the array, so I can just do this. I don't have to say it needs to be a comma, etc. but you can't ignore empty. So if for some reason, um, let's say that one of these is empty. I'm going to have to copy and paste values for this. So I'm going to copy and control shift V, control alt V, and then this is just going to be showing me like that. Uh, yep, it's not going to work with that cell, but if I select it like this, and don't use the hash symbol at the end, then it is going to show me a double comma like that. There's no way to avoid that. However, with text join, it would avoid that. Great, all right, so this is something that I really like. Uh, you know, another thing is like UK. Do you write that UK? Do you write that United Kingdom, Great Britain, GB, England? Like different drop-down menus if you're from the UK, which I am. We'll, we'll expect you to know just off the top of your head that it has to be one of these five things, um, which is kind of annoying. So yeah, that is a useful thing to have. So other data validation things that you can do. So I said define data types, um, also dates as well are useful to define. So select this, go to data validation and choose a date. Again, Excel kind of shows you before, greater than, less than. You do have to know that that's like greater than a start date. I wish it would show you before and after because that's how humans tend to say it, um, which Google Sheets does, but uh, it doesn't. So 2015, I'll say greater than or equal to, or on or after is what it should be called. And then if I try and type in 
something that's before 2014, that will not work. But also, if I try and type in, you know, even with a TH here, that will not work because Excel doesn't treat that as a date. So force people to enter data that's so important to avoid date errors. You can also do it with numbers. As I say, just define data types wherever it's possible. Go here and choose allow uh, a whole number or decimal, whatever you prefer. Quantity, you'd probably want to do whole number. And price, you might want to do decimal. I'm going to do great, greater than or equal to zero, just so people don't type in text accidentally or type in, you know, so many times people will write in text conditions, uh, you know, maybe in two installments. Don't do that. That's obviously going to cause errors. So if you force them to do data validation, that will stop that from happening. So here, let me show you again um, a decimal which is greater than or equal to zero. And let me also show you how to get the custom error message. So here you can write in whatever you want. Be sinister, great way to play pranks So April Fool's. I have a whole video <laughs> which I released on April Fool's Day one year about these kind of office related pranks, which is pretty good. Um, next up, locking cells. Now the official Excel way to do it is in the review tab and protect sheet. I really don't like this method. Here's what I tend to do. Um, I will, and let me just write in a formula here, just for argument's sake, to show you how this feature would work. So click anywhere in your in your sheet, and you can go to Home tab, Find and Select, Go to Special, or just go directly to Formulas, and then it will accept, it will select every single formula cell inside your file, which is this, this one, and all of these. Once you have that, this is what I tend to do. This is my method. Go to Data, Data Validation, and do Settings, and Decimal is equal to. Sorry. Keep getting that wrong. Here, equal to 69.52184302. Press OK. Now, you may be wondering why I've done that. Well, kind of like just a password. They can't enter something unless it's exactly that same number. And that goes over every single formula cell. Um, this, by the way, is a formula that shows me the sheet name that's linked dynamically. I, I like doing this. I think it's good. It's one of my more recent videos. Note that it changed based on that change. A um, couple of nuances about data validation. So it's sometimes difficult to see which ones they are. And you can actually copy and paste, and it will break them. So let's say that I have a misspelled name and maybe a number here that is uh, 17 but not paid. I can copy those, and I can paste them there. There you go. It's not even in the right column, but I'm going to copy and paste that. And I'm going to write in next Thursday here. And it hasn't stopped me from doing this. So it's kind of hard to know sometimes which cells of data validation, especially as they're broken by copy and paste. If you go to the Home tab, find and select, and go to Special, though, uh, you can have data validation all in same. All will make you see that it isn't applied to these cells. This one was unapplied as well. But if you want that to come across, you can copy that. Then you can paste on whatever you want. You can paste Special, and you can choose Validation. And this will paste only the data validation and nothing else, which is useful as well. Um, so yeah, another thing is, well, it's very good for applying things to prevent future errors, but what about existing errors? Can you use data validation to detect existing errors? Actually, you can. If you go to the data tab, you can choose over here, the dropdown and circle invalid data, and it draws really big red circles around your errors. Note that it did that for the formulas because, well, that's my password section, but it is quite useful here. And here, for example, C10 should have an E and not an A, so it's easy to see that and change it here. Maybe this is just 17. And this was a negative number accidentally. So if I do 800, that will work like this as well. So it can be good as well. If you have lots and lots of data, you can pre-apply data validation to it and then go to circle and valid data. And here you will see the big red circle that should say gov instead of government because that's how we've formatted this. And if you zoom out a lot, you can just scroll down and spot. Oh, there we have an error. It's a really subtle one to spot because this has actually a space at the end, so you wouldn't have seen it otherwise. Note that sometimes if you change it there, it doesn't get rid of the text when it's a drop down. It doesn't get rid of the red circle. It does when it's a number or a date though, HP. That should just be HP. Uh, note how useful the searchable drop down list is for these kind of things to prevent them happening. Uh, yeah, And then you can just scroll and in seconds, you can get this to work. There is a comma and then a full stop. Should probably just be a comma or yeah. There's 40,000. Note how the red outline went away. And you can just scroll and see very, very quickly where your errors are. There it is. Ha, someone wrote it in words, 9800. Don't think that would happen in real life, really. But yeah, really, really good, quick, easy way to identify where your errors are and fix it as need be. It doesn't apply to capitals. Uh, uppercase and lowercase doesn't matter for this. Here is, should just say, 
that's the allowed entry. So that's what we're going to use. If you press F2 and enter, it will get rid of the big red thing. And if you don't like them in general, you can just choose clear validation circles and then you won't see them anymore. All right, great. So back to some slide stuff. Things to avoid. Merging. I'm going to show you scenarios of when it's okay to merge and when it's not okay to merge. Um, everyone loves merging cells, but it does cause issues, as well as another thing that I'll show you as well in the next one. So over here, you have the worst type, which is merging cells inside a table. What's what happens here? I'm going to multiply these together, equals this times this. 200 times 3, 600. You may have guessed it. If I drag it down, it's 1,200. If I drag it down again, it's actually going to show me 0, uh, which is obviously an error. Drag it down, and this works. Which brings me to my next advice point. You should never, ever, ever merge cells inside a table. If you do, you will get errors. Now, what's actually happening? If I select my data and I go to unmerge, or I unclick this, then this is how the data shows. Now, Excel just looks different to us, but really the way it stores data is just in the top leftmost cell. So you multiply by a blank, you get zero, and that's what is happening here. Now, you might think, well, I won't do it for numbers. What about text? Text is also really bad. If you drag down and you and you want to click to filter only females, you might expect to see two, but you only get one entry because the other one is a blank cell. Same reason as before. So it looks like it's both of them together, but it's just a blank cell. So you should definitely avoid that inside a table. Second scenario is not quite as bad, but still should be avoided, which is where you have multi-row headers. So here I have item, Cambodia, cost order, Lao order cost, uh, Malaysia order cost, and then notes. Now, if I'm not going to get errors inside my table, but I'm going to be restricted in what I can do. If I go to insert a pivot table, it's going to give me an error, which basically means I have multi-row headers, so it can't do that. However, uh, also if I try and add filters in the Home tab and then filter here, this will add them in the wrong place, so I can't filter for this column ever. If I see that, that's only in the first column. Plus, it treats row number 23 as values, which is why we saw the, the word order in the filter here. So try and avoid it for a few reasons like that. Essentially, this data is something that's called pivoted data because we could create a pivot table, which has the data output like this, and it's good to have unpivoted data inside your file. So we're going to look at how to unpivot in a little bit, but essentially what you should look at is data that looks like this, where you've got a column for country, a single column for item, one for order, one for cost, rather than order cost, order cost, order cost, and then notes at the end. Now, where it's completely okay to merge your cells is if you do it on a comments or something that's outside of your table because you're never going to use this for analysis. Note that if you do want to do something different, though, you can do this trick. Select your cells, go to the Home tab, and choose Fill, and choose Justify. And that will fill it inside the box. Go back as well. Let me zoom out. So Fill and Justify will bring it back into the one cell like that. So that's an alternative to merging or unmerging. It looks like that. Another alternative is fill across selection. So let's say you want to fill this across like that. You can right click and choose uh, format cells. And then you can choose in, in uh, alignment. You have general, you have center across selection, which is much better than before like that. If I unwrap, then I'll see it going away uh, like that. I might want to make this a bit bigger to get it to fit in the box, but essentially that is an alternative to uh, centering it but it doesn't, it doesn't merge across multiple cells. Still though, try and avoid that for this because a, a good practice table should not have any merge cells. So much so that if I go back to my table examples, the merge and center button is grayed out, which is because you should never merge cells inside your table. So the other thing that I tend to dislike is people doing the hide thing. What happens when you hide is that it's very, very difficult to see that something's hidden. Apart from if you happen to look up here, you can see that the animate, the the UI is slightly different. There's this kind of double line um, and there's a skip, but who looks at the row numbers or letters and happens to do that every time? What I often do when I get a spreadsheet is I, I get it and I select all and I right click and I choose unhide and then I will um, also unmerge my cells just to avoid this happening. What is better is something like this where you get the user to be able to expand or collapse. It's much more obvious to see it. The way you do that is if you select some rows or columns, you go to the data tab and you choose this thing called group. Now, you might have outline, uh, depending how big your computer is, your screen is. So it might be under outline and then group. Ungroup gets rid of it. Ungroup in this cell will first ask you, do you want to ungroup rows or columns? I'm going to say columns, and it's going to get rid of this one in D, like that. You can also use grouping on multiple levels. So you can 
navigate your users. Number one is just showing the headers. Number two is just the solutions. Number three is showing everything like that. Rather than clicking on each individual node, you can also do it for the group in itself. You'd also have subtotals. I do tend to avoid these inside a table. Again, these are grayed out because uh, they lead to lots and lots of double counting errors. But the subtot if you are going to work with subtotals, then using this built-in feature is probably the best way to do that. All right. So how to deal with a situation where you've got some data that already is pivoted, like this. Here I have the name of the country across the top, and I want to unpivot it. Or multi-row headers. Um, so you can select your data like this, go to the data tab and choose from table or range. If you have your data inside a table, it will load up the Power Query editor automatically. Otherwise, it will ask you to make a table. Alternatively, you can use a named range as I'll show you in the next example. So this is the Power Query editor. That's a whole new table that's not even Excel anymore. I love Power Query, the amount that it can do, particularly for this thing called Unpivot that you can't do any other way in Excel, uh, except for through very convoluted methods. So if you select the columns you want to Unpivot, you can go to Transform. And personally, I don't like the first one. I would do unpivot only selected columns. Rename this to be country. And then you've gone from pivoted, it looks like that, to unpivoted, it looks like this. And when you're done, you can press close and load, and that will load it to create a new, a new sheet with your table that's loaded like that. It is linked as all of Power Query is, so if I change the input, the output will change as well. Now, let's do a more complex example here where we have some multi-row headers, headers on row 27 and 28. So first, I'm not going to make this into a table because then it's going to unmerge my cells. I'm going to keep this source table as is. So to do that, you, you can go to the name box and type in uh, a name, so data to unpivot. Again, no spaces. And if you go to the data tab and from table or range, it will just load off the Power Query without unmerging the cells in your source data. So my actual headers are in the first two rows, but I'm going to want to merge that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to Go to the transform tab and I'm going to not use first row as headers, but the second one to relegate these headers down there. Then I've just got this like that. Sometimes you get the null values, sometimes you'll get this one um, if you were using a table before. So after I've got this, I'm going to actually then um, transpose it because you can't merge rows in Power Query, but you can merge columns. So transpose will give you this. And what I want to do is combine these into one header. So I don't need column two, I'm gonna click on that cell and I'm gonna choose replace values. And I'm going to replace that with null and it's going to show me like this. Then I'm going to want to fill this down. So this says summary expenditure. So click on that and fill down. And then these will always be amount. So actual amount, budget amount. So let's say I'm going to do the fill down as well. You don't have to do this if you think it's more, it's obvious enough to say the other things, then that's okay. Then I'm going to select these two columns. I'm gonna to go to transform and merge columns. And I'm going to say the separator is going to be a space. And I'm just going to say headers. I don't actually need to do this because I'm going to remove this row anyway, but that could be good practice. Next, I'm going to transpose it again. And I'm going to use first row as headers. And now I have my headers on one row and not two. And I can go to close and load. Now in certain scenarios, it, it might be a lot of rows, so it's not really practical to do that method exactly, but I have a video with more advanced methods for how to do this kind of thing. Even if you have thousands and thousands of rows, then it can still work. Uh, it's just the transpose will only happen to whatever rows your headers are on. So you covered things to avoid as well, good practice. And then, so avoid things like multiple tabs. Um, best to do them on one table and then use filters or a slicer to avoid that. The external data report curse, this is often when you export from a different system. Power Query can help to clean that up. And the semi report where we have multi-row headers like this, uh, that I showed you how to clean up. All right, here is another version of multi-row headers. The best way to set up a table, values of one type in the same column. One single row for headers with unique names. Avoid blanks, avoid merge cells, and avoid subtotals. The issue with blanks inside a table is that it, Excel doesn't know, does this mean it's a null value? Does this mean it's something that is unknown for now but will be filled out later, etc. cetera? Um, it's great to have entirely blank rows around your table. That way, Excel will split it out. So to show you um, some examples here. So here I also have, I tend to um, give instructions for what each column is, like this. It's color-coded using conditional formatting. So anything that is data validation says choose. Anything that is free type is green. Um, and then anything that's formula is in red. And this is text that contains conditional formatting. I also will have these plus or minus buttons if I 
want people to only see certain aspects of it. I don't always do this. It is sometimes nice for people to see each end of the table in one screen without scrolling back and forth. If I'm going to have formulas, though, then I do them on the far right usually. Occasionally, I'll do them on the far left because that way people can just kind of type across in the middle section without accidentally typing over a formula column that might be in the middle of non-type columns. So that's what I will sometimes, I will often do. Have the formulas or the fixed cells, like maybe reference number one, two, three, four, have that on the far left, the far right, and give these instructions up here. Um, do freeze your panes as well then. The freeze panes is in the view tab and then freeze panes and freeze panes like that. Great, and then entirely blank rows, even if you don't have a table, so let's look over here. So if you have an entirely blank row like this, then Control A will select only a table. If you add filters in the data tab and then filter, that will go to the right place. But if you have some extra text just connecting them, Control A will now select everything that's connected and it can keep going. If this is more data, then it will select up to there. So best to have entirely blank rows around your table. Also, if your filters go into the wrong place, then that's probably because of what I just explained like that. So yeah, so that is, um, a summary of what I've done here, and do have your formulas, have completely consistent formulas inside your column, and use if formulas if you need to to get there. Data validation on all of your cells, whether they're text, whether they're numbers, choose number, whether they're dates like this. Use a table from the insert table here, or as I call them, super tables. Use conditional formatting to um, highlight things instead of manual coloring as well. So I hope you've enjoyed that. My name has been David Benheim, and I release lots of videos on Excel uh, PowerPoint, Power BI, Zoom Teams. If you're using Tech of the Workplace, then I tend to release a weekly video on that. And here is my LinkedIn. And if you want to follow me on LinkedIn, it's Dave Benign as well. Great. I hope you've enjoyed that. Unfortunately, I can't make the session to stay behind for a Q&A because um, I just have other things that came up and I really wanted to contribute to this, but unfortunately I can't be there with you for the Q&A. But I hope, I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, then feel free to leave a comment on my YouTube videos that are relevant to it. Because as I said, auto color in Excel, uh, confused by Excel pivot tables, watch this. A lot of what I've shown you, text split with auto dropdown, are covered in this channel, as well as Google Sheets alternatives as well. Thanks for watching. I just have other things that came up and I really wanted to contribute to this, but unfortunately I can't be there with you for the Q&A. But I hope, I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, then feel free to leave a comment on my YouTube videos that are relevant to it. Because as I said, auto color in Excel, uh, confused by Excel pivot tables, watch this. A lot of what I've shown you, text split with auto dropdown, are covered in this channel, as well as Google Sheets alternatives as well. Thanks for watching. All right. Um, thank you to David for uh, recording that video for us. As he mentioned, um, he's not in a position to be here to be able to um, <clears throat> to present the video and answer questions, unfortunately. So uh, there was one question that was in the chat uh, that I've tried to answer in the meantime. Uh, but if you did have any other questions, uh, do feel free to pop them into the Q&A and we can compile them for David and uh, have him try to answer them uh, for when we put this video up online. In the meantime, I guess, uh, you know, take take a chance to uh, respond to the feedback, uh, feedback presentation. Um, you scan the QR code or follow the link uh, bit.ly slash EVG 2022 feedback, remembering uh, that the Bitly links are case sensitive. Uh, we want to hear what you think about all of these sessions. Um, if you find that you uh, ha have missed a session and forgot to, forgot to provide some feedback, uh, you're more than welcome to use the same code and just choose which session you need to, uh, to present, uh, to provide the feedback for.